This is Newsroom. Hello and welcome from Johannesburg here in South Africa. I'm Evan Janssen. This show is live. Broadcast from our studios here in Auckland Park. We're also streaming live on YouTube with the entire show available on demand on our YouTube channel. Today we look back at the tragic passing of Public Service and Administration Minister Colin Stefani died in a tragic accident this weekend past. Then we shift our attention to food security and hunger here in South Africa. We close today by getting an update on albino killings in Tanzania and have a look at baby dumping in South Africa. But first, let's take a look at the news headlines. Tributes continue to pour in after the tragic passing of Public Service and Administration Minister Colin Chabane. 54-year-old Chabane and his two bodyguards were killed in a car crash on the N1 near Polokwane early yesterday morning. He'll be accorded a special official funeral at a date yet to be announced. It's the saddest moment um, for me and I think it's a saddest moment for everyone in the African National Congress. But I think it's a sad for South Africa overall because here we have lost a giant, we've, we've lost an intellectual of note. Minister Collins Chabani was a talented minister, completely dedicated to the task of achieving the objectives of our revolution. Minister Chabani was a humble, disciplined, passionate and dedicated member of the executive. On behalf of the Congress of the People, would like to convey our uh, condolences to, to the family, to friends, to the African National Congress and other organizations and communities that he served. It is absolutely shocking. Uh, Minister Collins Chabane was one of the more hard-working ministers in the cabinet. Um, he will be remembered for, he is the father of the whole idea of uh, performance monitoring and evaluation in the presidency. The woman accused of Stabbing Kululeka Habedi, known as Flabba, to death, is expected to appear in the Alexandra Magistrates Court in Johannesburg today. Flabba was stabbed to death at his home in Alexandra last week Monday. Police arrested his girlfriend, Sindisiwe Mangnele. During her last appearance, Mangnele told a packed court she had sustained bruises and stab wounds to her arms and stomach. But even if they say you love you so, will forever be in our home. I know that you're never going to walk through that door, and that makes my heart really, really sore. I will always love you. Yours truly, Mpo Habedi. Rest in peace, my husband. Eleven people suspected to be part of a truck hijacking syndicate will appear in the Palm Ridge Magistrates Court today. They were arrested in Leondale, east of Johannesburg, after police found 20 trucks in a factory. Police also discovered steel and fuel worth millions of rands. The syndicate is believed to be operating countrywide. Four suspects will appear today in the Johannesburg Magistrates Court for allegedly robbing an SABC News crew at gunpoint last week near Mill Park Hospital. SABC contributing editor Fuyam Voko, foreign editor Sophie McQuenna, journalist Griselda Lewis and other members of the crew have since identified their cell phones and a laptop that that were taken by the sub suspects. One suspect who took part in the mugging incident still at large. Two of the four suspects were arrested for buying the stolen goods. South Sudan's government has criticized the United States for drafting a resolution that threatens to blacklist anyone undermining security or interfering with South Sudan's peace after March and April deadline, deadlines set by the regional East Coast bloc. Now I can tell you Well, now I can tell you that President Jacob Zuma has just arrived at the Chabani family home 
in Vartikloof, just east of Pretoria. Let's go to our presidential correspondent, who is uh, Mzwandile Mbeche. He's live outside the venue. Very good morning to you, uh, Zwan. Can you hear us? Good morning, Zwandile Mbeche. Can you hear me? Well, unfortunately, uh, we don't have him ready yet, as you say, fluttering around as the president arriving there at the family home. But just, let's just recap. Of course, President Jacob Zuma has appointed the Minister of Arts and Culture, Nati Tetwa, as the Acting Minister of Public Service and Administration following the death of Minister Collins Chabani. He was killed in a collision on the N1 in Polokwane yesterday. President Zuma has extended his condolences to the staff of the Department of Public Service and Administration, who have lost their second minister in a short space of time. Of course, the president arrived at the Chabana family home in Vardakluf and in, outside of Pretoria a few minutes ago. Minister Chabani will be accorded a special official funeral at a date that will still be announced. Mourners came in droves to support the family. They expressed shock at the loss of a much respected Kedine minister. Several cabinet ministers came to support the family and pay their last respects, and it's been a heartfelt loss for his colleagues. After returning from the accident scene on the N1 in Limpopo, Chabane's wife was met by a house packed with mourners. Basic Education Minister Angie Mutsera and Environmental Affairs Minister Edna Mulewa led the delegation that traveled with Chabane's wife to the accident scene. It was very much traumatic, uh, but as a family we had to find closure. In order for us to believe that indeed our brother has passed on, we had to go to that, that accident scene and see for ourselves that indeed Collins is normal. We had to carry the spear and move forward. It's not only him who passed on in that accident, and also the protectors who were part of our DNA as a family. I've known uh, Sikele and Letualo uh, since 2009. Till today, I regarded them as my brothers. So I've lost three members of the family. Deputy President Cyril Ramaphosa was among the many mourners who flocked to the Chabani home. Our country is under the shadow of sadness. We have lost one of uh, the gallant members of President Zuma's cabinet, Minister Collins Chabani, was a talented minister, completely dedicated to the task of achieving the objectives of our revolution. He has contributed greatly to the progress that we have made in this country. He emphasized that government will also support and pay respect to the families of Chabane's two bodyguards who perished with him in the dreadful car crash. Memorial and funeral arrangements will be announced this week. Well, Mzwandile Mbeje, the presidential uh, correspondent, is outside the Chabane family home in Vardakluf, east of Pretoria. Very good morning to you, Mbeje. A very good morning to you, Evan. Zondile, it must be a somber mood uh, where you are right now, but I understand the president has arrived. Just give us a little bit of detail. Indeed, indeed, uh, Evan, it's, it's, it's a very somber mood. Uh, the head of state, President Jacob Zuma, has just arrived, and uh, he has just walked inside uh, to comfort the family. And uh, there is also a number of other ministers as well who have joined him. And then they've also arrived uh, to make sure that uh, they pay their last respects and they can comfort the family. You would know that uh, yesterday government announced that uh, Minister Shaban as the serving minister will be afforded a special official funeral. And uh, it's, it's, in, it's in honor of what uh, uh, Minister uh, has done. Earlier on, we spoke to Deputy Minister uh, in his office, uh, Minister Ayanda Jodlo, who said uh, uh, Minister Chabane will be solely missed for, for his uh, uh, contribution uh, to the public service. But uh, they have no choice. They have to pick up the spear because uh, the nation expects uh, that uh, they deliver for them as uh, Chabane wanted them to do. The, the community of the uh, Baapalaborwa municipality They've really idolized uh, 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 this minister, Collins Chabane, uh, uh, in, in that part of the country. Tell us a little bit about, uh, about the work that is done in, in that community specifically in recent times. 
Uh, Eben, you know that uh, Minister Chabane is a very humble minister and he is described as a servant of the people. He's one of those people who are very much involved in the communities. Uh, one of the things perhaps you'd remember about him is that uh, other than being a minister, he actually is also a musician. When he had time, he would uh, then sing with his people, he would be with his people, and then people in that way were able to relate to him because here was a person they found that uh, it's easy to work with. I mean, um, sometimes, you know, other people, when they hold high office, it becomes very, very difficult to relate with them. If people have issues, you would even remember with the issue of Malamulele, um, at some point, they, they were the ministers who went to the people to say, this thing is being addressed. But of course, you know, the, the timbers were at a boiling point at the time. So a, a, a certain way had to be found to mm -hmm. deal with those issues. But what I can say is that Minister Shabane is very well known throughout the country in his communities for his work, for, 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 for maintaining the roots. Even when, 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 when he met his last hour, this is the minister who had gone to his village to be with his people to bury the local chief. Uh, Evan, what more can you really want as evidence that this was the minister who was still connected with his people? Zondile, let's just go back to the accident. Do we have any updates as to uh, what uh, the, process, uh, the process and procedures that we're following uh, with regards to the accident? As you know, uh, Eben, that um, the accident happened in the early hours of Sunday morning, and then the, adv the, the, the investigations are obviously underway. Of course, there would be preliminary um, findings in terms of what could have happened. I think it's common cause that uh, the truck that was traveling the same direction with the, 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 the car of Minister Shabane um, turned, and then the, the car of Minister Chabane then hit that, that, um, that, that truck so resulting in this kind of accident. So you know that uh, the forensics yesterday, for example, so they cordoned off the area because they wanted to pick up whatever, whatever little evidence is there to be able to piece uh, the pieces together to say what exactly transpired. Yes, it's common cause that it was a, 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 a car hitting uh, the truck, but of course you would need uh, the thorough investigations currently that is what is uh, underway. You would know that the driver of the truck was actually found to be, according to the police, not sober. So which means um, there was a, a situation of drunken driving there. And this driver, we are told, has also outstanding cases relating to, to the same offenses. And there is actually one here at, at, in, in, in Gauteng at Ivory Park relating to the same situation, which has not been finalized. And uh, the details Eben, will start emerging when um, the, he makes an appearance tomorrow at the Polokwane Magistrate Court. You know that uh, mm. he's scheduled to appear there tomorrow. Zondile, in conclusion, I know it's a little bit early in the week, but uh, we know it's going to be a special official funeral. Do we have time frames as to how uh, uh, matters will proceed this week? What I can say, um, Eben, is that... Um, Ordinarily, the funerals of this nature take place on weekends. If you look at the weekend that we are going to, it's quite a packed weekend in terms of the programs, in terms of what's going to be happening. On Saturday, for example, is the 21st, and that is the Human Rights Day. And you know, there's a lot of activities planned throughout the country for, for, for that kind of occasion. And then on the 22nd is the reburial of Jamie J.P. Marx. You know that um, mm. J.P. Marx's mortal remains were repatriated from Russia together with those of Moses Kodane, who, who was repaired uh, last week at uh, Bella in the northwest. So what is happening on the 22nd uh, on Sunday is that uh, those of J.P. Marx will be then uh, repaired. So given that uh, this weekend appears to be very packed in terms of the program of what we know, um, it, it's very curious, really, uh, to, to know when exactly perhaps this funeral will be. I won't be surprised, uh, Eben, if uh, a date, which is midweek, is actually uh, announced. Because uh, waiting, for example, for, 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 for next week may be a bit too far, maybe for mm. the families. But all that process 
will, 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 will culminate uh, into a decision that will be arrived at uh, after consultations between the family and government. So, as you know, if it's special official funeral, the government there takes uh, an, an, an active role. So, the, the, the government, as Minister had indicated yesterday, they will be able to come to us and indicate what is happening. Now, they are allowing the family to grieve and then they are comforting the family, whilst in, in the meantime they are busy with those logistics. So I hope uh, perhaps today or even tomorrow we may have an idea of uh, when this uh, will happen. Thank you very much, Zoya. That's uh, our presidential correspondent, Mzondili Mbeje, who is outside uh, the Chabane family house in Vatikluf, Pretoria, where the president has just arrived there to comfort the family after this uh, stunning loss they suffered over the weekend. Of course, uh, Public Service and Administration Minister Collins Chabane died tragically in the early hours of Sunday morning in an accident uh, on the N1 highway just outside of Paul Aquana. But let's have a look at some of your views, some of your tweets uh, on this uh, tragic accident. Joss Speak Africa says, My heartfelt condolences to the family of Collins Chabane who will be remembered in his great work during the funeral of Tata Madiba. Very sad. Mokoshlane Ramamwani says, everyone is concerned about the minister, but about his guard and driver. Condolences to their family. I think that's been sorted out. Jabulani Nzilani says, Colin Chabani was a true servant to the people who joined the struggle for liberation at a very young age and soon went into exile. There you have a picture tribute of Colin Chabani. I love morning says, 2015 has to start getting better. For South Africa, we're losing so many celebrated people. Rest in peace, Minister Collins Chabani. Some of the views coming in after this tragic accident over the weekend. Today's picture of the day, something completely different. It comes from Oyama Buata. Roads must fall. And this is, of course, a few roar up in Cape Town at the University of Cape Town, where uh, some groups want them. The statue of Cecil John Rhodes to be taken down. And there you have a picture of the statue that's covered there in protest. That's in Cape Town. Let's now take a look at the front pages from around the globe. In Europe, the Times reports that a tip-off from desperate parents led to Turkish police swoop on three British teenagers as they allegedly traveled to join the Islamic State. Two 17-year-old Muslim boys from the Pakistani community in Brent, northwest London, and a 19-year-old man were intercepted in Istanbul at the weekend and swiftly returned to England. Then, in Australia, Daily Telegraph, a man charged over the axe murder of his father allegedly took out multiple life insurance policies worth millions of dollars in his name just weeks before he was killed. And then in Israel, the Jerusalem Post, tens of thousands of demonstrators have fled Tel Aviv's Rabin Square to support the right-wing government Sunday night in a rally titled United for the Land of Israel. It's ahead of the Israeli legislative elections, which is set to take place tomorrow. Let's now take a look at what's happening across our country, what's happening here in South Africa. We start in Johannesburg, Alexandra Magistrate's Court, where Cindy Mangale is expected to appear in connection with the death of musician Nkululeka Habedi. We stay in the High Court here in Johannesburg, sitting in Palm Reach. The trial of Lindrick Kaku will resume. Kaku will appear on 18 charges, including the killing of three-year-old Luke Tibbets. And then we move to the Cape Town High Court. The sentencing of Tandi Makubela is expected to get underway. Makubela was found guilty of killing her acting husband, husband Patrick Makubela, in June of 2009. Time for us to take a short little break. This is Newsroom on the CBC News. food is not always the cheapest food option and so making the healthy choices the easier choices remain a health challenge for South African children. Bipolar disorder is said to affect one in a hundred people. Low back pain, 
the most common spinal disorder affects about 8 out of 10 people at some point in their lives. Back pain persists for more than a week or two. Seek advice. I'm Dr. Silla Mudaou. Watch Health Talk every Saturday on SABC. Welcome back. This is Newsroom. South Africa is in the grips of a massive drought that could impact on food production, especially maize. That is the staple food of many, including, including animals here in this country. The country could face a maize shortage and might have to import the grain if the present dry weather conditions persist. The Department of Agriculture has urged farmers to take precautionary measures during the dry weather spells with high temperatures reported since the beginning of 2015, it is in some parts of the country. This has affected crop production in areas like the Free State, KwaZulu-Natal, Northwest and Mpumalanga. Now, the program coordinator for the Faculty of Agriculture, Science and Technology at the Northwest University, Jose Ramachela, he says South Africa and Southern Africa as a whole experiences a 10-year cycle which is related to the El Nino effect. Now, he joins us in our Northwest studio in Mahi Kang to talk about this. A very good morning to you, Mr. Ramachela. Thank you for joining us. Oh, good morning. Good morning. How are you? Very good today. Unfortunately, it seems as if the farming communities could be better, especially in your part of the world. You talk about a 10-year dry cycle. Just, just tell us about the effect that you see this having on our especially maize production. Well, the, the drought, whether it's a 10-year cycle or the effects of the global warming, um, is still an issue which is need to be verified. But I think climate change is here with us, and um, the impacts you know, are terrible for the direct, for ordinary citizens, also for the industry, and uh, sort of uh, for the region as a whole. In some areas, like the Western Cape, uh, we've seen uh, felt fires. We see a lot of weird weather patterns around the country, floods in areas we don't see before. Is, how is climate change pl playing into this scenario that's playing out at the moment? Yes. Um, first of all, the unfortunate part of it is the countries which are most affected are the countries which contrib contribute the least in terms of climate change. Um, some countries will experience floods, looking at Mozambique, Malawi, and some other part, uh, countries will experience droughts, particularly like South Africa. The Western Cape, particularly, is the issue of, uh, you know, the winds, the dry spell, you know, when the fires start, you know, it has devastating effect. Um, with Northwest and um, Free State, uh, Limpopo and KwaZulu-Natal, you might have rains, um, maybe falling in December and January, and then the rains disappear. We're looking at now the issues of distribution. When you look at uh, definition of drought in terms of agriculture, is the distribution of rainfall is very important, and particularly February, where the maize, maize is tussling, the impact you know is devastating. The crop it becomes um, sort of useless for for grain production. You say that the maize areas. How big is the loss that you think that we're going to suffer this year and then in the years to come as this gets worse? You know, the, the, this year the, the situation is terrible. Um, when you look around, you know, the northwest particularly, you know, which is considered the maize triangle in the country and maybe neighboring free state, the impact is direct effect in terms of uh, as a staple food and also the downstream industry. When you're looking at the dairy products which rely on maize, the Pigger industry, um, it's quite a range. You know, looking at the clothing industry, we produce cotton. You know, those are the products which are, uh, are directly uh, affected. And if the country has to uh, look at food security at national level, um, there might be a need to import uh, maize, and that has got also other direct effects in terms of uh, the high cost of the imported maize or, or the risk of importing. Uh, pests and diseases from 
other regions of the world, um, you know, those are the, 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 the devastating effects. And the continuation of drought uh, it might not necessarily affect maize alone. The, you know, mm. the whole issues and like pasture, the animals uh, might be affected in terms of um, availability of uh, grazing. So it is uh, really, you know, a wide spectrum of impact, you know, both social and um, ecological impact. The picture looks rather bleak. I thank you for joining us today. That's the program coordinator for the Faculty of Agriculture, Science and Technology at the Northwest University, uh, Josi Rama Chela, and he joined us live uh, in our studio in Mahi Kang. We're talking, uh, if you weren't really in listening, about this dry spell that's sweeping across uh, South Africa's north and eastern parts, resulting in poor crop production. Uh, this could result in escalating food prices in a country where one in four people already go to bed hungry uh, most nights. The Food Sovereignty Campaign aims to fight for land and agrarian reform and rights for small-scale farmers to land and water, amongst other things. Experts warn that the country's growing energy crisis and land holdings bill which will prohibit foreign land ownership, could be to blame for South Africa's blooming food crisis. Well, let's talk to them. We are joined from Cape Town by Imran Mukadam, who is member of the Food Sovereignty Campaign's organizing committee. A very good morning to you, Mr. Mukadam. I thank you for, for joining us. Uh, good morning, and thank you for having us and, and, and this important discussion that we're having. One in four people go to bed hungry in South Africa. We've just heard the, the, the outlook with droughts in the eastern and, and, and northwestern parts of the country is not good. Are you concerned about this? Most definitely. Uh, this is exactly why this campaign has been launched. It is specifically to look at the issue of um, food sovereignty and the fact that our communities are going hungry and that... Um, the issue has, is starting to take on critical proportions and um, our role is to highlight this and to build um, a strong campaign and strong public awareness and strong uh, solidarity around the issues of food and hunger and how we as a community and as a, as a country can address these uh, collectively and come up with solutions um, for the crisis that we're facing. Government's National Food and Nutrition Security Plan. What are your views on it? Well, uh, we definitely think it doesn't go far enough, and we also feel that it still protects uh, corporate monopoly interests. So um, you find that um, looking at small-scale farmers, looking at organic farmers, looking at communities and food sovereignty, which is what we're about, it uh, doesn't go far enough to, um, to address these vital issues that are so critical for um, the continued food security of our, of our communities and our people. So we, th we believe that there's a lot more that can be done, especially with regards to access to land, access to, to, um, to farm uh, lands and, and, and food production for communities and cooperatives. And we think the focus should shift from um, monocropping and, and, and agribusiness to a concept of agroecology which is more in tune with um, the changing climate and with the optimum use of land and, and the resources that's available. Now some experts, and, and I use that as a very loose term, they claim that the, the land holdings bill will affect food security in South Africa. How do you view that? Is that accurate or is that fear mongering? Um, I think it's, it's, it's uh, protecting current monopoly interest and the current um, status quo. So they are scared of losing um, the monopoly that they have on food production in South Africa. And we are saying that it's about time that we break these monopolies. If you look at food production in South Africa, it's being uh, controlled by four or five major players. And there's no room for small-scale operators. There's no room for new entrants into the food production system because of the type of monopoly that is being held by these uh, food agro-processing uh, monopolies. And um, our focus is on acquiring and accessing land for small-scale uh, farmers, for family farmers, um, which has proven throughout history to be the most efficient way in which food can be produced and which in, 
essence um, is in harmony with nature. And, and these are the issues that we are being uh, challenged with, especially with uh, climate change and, and the previous insert speaking about the drought issues. Um, and we find that if that same amount of land that has been um, planted with only maize, if it had been planted with a multi multiple uh, crops, that you would have a lot more sustainability and a lot more um, yield from that very same land, and you won't do as much damage to the environment by using all these chemical fertilizers. The immediate threat, though, to food security drought in South Africa, especially maize, which is a staple here for us. How do you see us overcome this immediate threat? Well, it would mean that we, we would have to have some form of state intervention and the impact on the very poor needs to be mitigated. So we believe right now, um, as the Food Sovereignty Campaign, it's important for um, some form of government intervention within the food supply chain. And in order to ensure that these uh, uh, natural crises and disasters that we're facing and that we will continue to face as, as our climate uh, becomes uh, more um, vulnerable, is to um, ensure that food supply is guaranteed and that the poor have access to sufficient nutritional food. So we believe the first step would be that we have some form of fund or intervention in, in, in subsidizing, especially maize supply to the very poor. Well, I thank you for joining us today. A flyer from Cape Town, Imran Mukadam, is a member of the Food Sovereignty Campaigns. He's on the organizing committee. And they say small-scale farming will help with sorting out our food security problem that we have. That goes against what, of course, the so-called experts tell us, that uh, land reform is a threat to food security. Somehow, it doesn't make, doesn't make sense. What are your views? At SABC Newsroom, that's where we love to hear from you. Let's take a look at what, you, what, what you're talking about with regards to food and farming. SAF Food Lab says, did you know the average age of South African commercial farmers? 62. As they, re as they retire, we can expect food shortages. I don't think so, really. Janine Matthews says, so the more people that can work correctly, the more it will be benefit our country, our food supply and economy. Both South Africa together, this sentiment is a correct one. We need to share the skills. Sam Tandazo Plata says, some fund sales says land reform that involves taking land and giving it to people who can't farm, it's a threat to SS food security, question mark. That is a question we've asked this morning. And uh, the Food Sovereignty Campaign believes that is untrue. They say, actually, the opposite has been, has been true throughout human history. Small-scale farmers means more security. Only thing is, you need more small-scale farmers. More food security. At SABC Newsroom, send us your views on that. Now, tweet of the day. Let's go to our tweet of the day from the static Law Mining. Uh, becoming so big in South Africa that it may be a threat to food security. Mining priorities over agriculture. That's an interesting add-on to the discussion around food security that we've just had. But let's have a look at what's on our Facebook page. What can you look forward to there? You can read all about the investigation into the cause of the crash in which Public Service Minister Colin Chabane was killed. Then the four suspects arrested for allegedly robbing a South African uh, SABC news group last week will appear in the Johannesburg Magistrates Court today. And then more on the three male British teenagers suspected of planning to join the Islamic State militants in Syria. Now they've been arrested by London police after being deported from Turkey. You can find all of those stories and a whole lot more on that Facebook page there. It's Newsroom. That's what you type into the search bar. Of course, sabc.co.za. That's uh, 4 slash news. That's where you get news updates to the minute. Let's take a break. You're watching Newsroom on SABC News.
Cameroon's economic capital, a unique art collection is on display. Titled Yesterday's Memory, Tomorrow's Memory. We are trying to preserve this heritage despite many things that have changed in the designing, embroidery and the model. If I'm telling you, you don't like it, I call it defeat. Join Musam Khalifi on Afro Show Biz every Saturday at 19.30 CAT. Datacom could miss a deadline for a crucial step towards turning on the Madupi power station. But the power utility says it will probably meet the December the 24th deadline. We're looking good. We've come through three days, obviously, of load shedding, which uh, has unfortunately been necessary, but it's be been useful to have built up our reserves for the coming week. Shares of private hospital group Netcare jumped up today and closed on a high after the company reported increased annual profits. The hospital group is also taking steps to aggressively reduce its dependence on ESCOM due to increasing power outages and rising costs. We'll be reducing our energy needs by some 35% over the next 10 years and our cumulative savings of our forecast electricity bill will be in the region of a billion rand. So we're doing something very constructive uh, about the challenges we're facing at the moment. That's business news. Weekdays at, at 6 p.m. on SABC News. Welcome back. This is Newsroom here on SABC News. Unwanted, unloved and abandoned. That is the sad reality of thousands of children living in South Africa. In recent weeks, there have been a number of reports of babies being found in rubbish dumps, storm drains and toilets, despite the fact that this act is illegal. Now, joining us in studio today to tell us about this growing social crisis is the Assistant Director at Joburg Child Welfare, Welfare that is, Carol Buse. Very good morning to you. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. Why are we seeing an increase in this kind of behaviour, baby dumping, here in South Africa? I don't know if there's an increase. It's something that has always been with us. And we do go through spates where it seems to increase and other times that it seems to go down a little bit more. We don't know why people do this because we don't ever get to interview the mothers. So, because they disappear. Um, but it must be a very desperate act. I think it's not a normal thing to do. People don't just leave their babies anywhere. And um, I think that the desperation comes from poverty, comes from having nowhere to leave your baby, nowhere that I can take care of my baby. So, that, I think that is why people will leave their babies in a toilet, in a in a dustbin bag, and it's very sad. So, some, you, you, you've mentioned a couple of factors. Some people, I, I can't get my head around it, no matter how difficult it is. Surely there must be a maternal instinct that, that, that makes you want to care for the child and, yes. and keep the child alive and not throw it away in some storm drain. Yes. Is it really, is it, desper is it desperation, poverty, or, or is there... A, a mental health aspect that maybe needs to be looked into? There might be both. There might be a mental health aspect and there may, there may be a desperation. We do find some babies <clears throat> where um, the mom has left the baby well wrapped up, um, maybe with a bottle, maybe even with a road to health card with the name scratched out so that we know how many um, vaccinations the child has had. There you see that the mom has really tried very hard. Um, to wrap the baby in a, in a dustbin bag is really something that yes, all of us would find abhorrent. So there are, different, there are different things that are happening with all of these moms. And I'd love to know what is going on in their minds because then we can help them better. The measures that are, we see some horrific pictures where these babies are found once they're being dumped. Uh, can you tell us the process and the measures that are taken after babies found like that? And, and also, how many babies survive these kinds of things, the sort of ratios we look at? Well, we get around 30 abandoned ch children. And it's not only babies, it's also older children. We can get a four-year-old, a five-year-old. Is that monthly? 
a 30, um, yes, and that's to our organisation. And we're not the only ones in Johannesburg yeah. who are so dealing with... it's one a day almost. Yeah, it can be, well, we, um, um, we work 21 days a week, a, a month, so it's more than one a day. Sometimes we can have three or four children a day. Um, obviously, one of the first things is to open a criminal case because um, abandonment is a criminal, um, a criminal act. So we have to um, involve the police. And then we have to, obviously, first thing is to look for someone who's going to take care of that child. So we look for a temporary safe care parent or a children's home. And that's difficult because there are not many people who will take care of mm. a child like that. Um, so we place the child in care. Um, and then we start with b medical tests, see how healthy the child is. Um, we have to advertise the child. We have to try and find the parents. Obviously, that is something, because sometimes a child is just lost. If yeah. it's a, a, a two-year-old or a three-year-old, it, it could be a lost child. Um, and that, that can be a long process. We have to give the child a name. So mm. we have to decide that this child is going to be called this um, name, this surname. Yeah. And that can be a, a difficult thing because we're also giving that child then a culture. A culture and um, an identity. And yes. And in some, even religion in some cases. Yes. And, um, and then um, we start with the, the process of a, of a permanent placement. And yeah. the first prize would be to have the child adopted. Um, in a permanent um, family. But foster care is also a permanent family. Yeah. So um, we look for a permanent family for that child. Adoption levels are also quite low in South Africa. What would your advice be to uh, a young mother who's feeling rather hopeless and desperate and they are considering abandoning or getting rid of their unborn child right now? Rather sign consent for that child to be adopted because then the child has a history. When, the, when there's no history, when a child is abandoned, there's no history for that child. So when the child becomes an adult and they want to know, who am I actually? Yeah. They have no history. But if, I, if the mom signs consent, then we do have a history for the child. Um, they, don't, they don't have a blank. Um, so if, if they really cannot take care of the child, sign consent for the adoption of the child. It goes quicker. The, the, the placement into a permanent um, family um, goes quicker that way. And, yeah. then, and it is an easier process for the child to accept later on. Well, I thank you for joining us. It's a very concerning matter. <laughs> Very concerning matter in South Africa. That's the Assistant Director at Johannesburg Child Welfare, Carol Buse, joining us today to talk about, well, abandonment of children, baby dumping, as it's become known in the mainstream media here in South Africa. Now we move our focus to East Africa, where albinism is prevalent. People born without pigment in their skin are thought to possess special powers, but not in a good way. Superstitions feed myths that albinos are ghosts, sorcerers, or demons who've been cursed and, when hunted and killed for their body parts, bring good luck to others. At least 75 albinos have been killed in the past three years alone in Tanzania. The number of arrests linked to the killings have also increased now. About 200 witch doctors and soothsayers have been arrested and 17 of them convicted of these murders are now on death row. The Tanzanian government is hoping that this crackdown will put an end to the ritual killings in that country. Now, for the latest, we are joined by Ali Posse, who uh, joins us live on the line from Tanzania. A very good morning to you, and thank you for joining us. Good morning to you, sir. Just give us an update. What's the latest with regards to the killings of people with albinism in Tanzania? Well, the, the latest is... Um after the, the um, murder of uh, Johanna, which happened with, with, uh, last two weeks, um, the president met with the Tanzanian Albino Society uh, to discuss on the measures that are to be taken. And then they, it happened that uh, there were rampant arrests of six doctors. But uh, that seemed not to work because. Recently, last week, a young boy was attacked in one of the southern regions in Tanzania. So, well, attacked at the moment, remember that we are going through the election 
um, it has been hopeful that if you are saved, that's why uh, our class seemed to increase more and more in 2015 um, compared to the last two to three years past. So nothing has changed, and well, unfortunately, more attacks uh, might happen in the future this year. The UN released this report also saying that they expect killings to get worse in Tanzania this year as there's an election, of course, in October and politicians will be turning to witch doctors. That will see another surge in the killings. What, what is your government saying and what is your view? Well, the government is saying that we are, uh, as people in the government point of view, they say that they are taking uh, measures uh, in Africa, yes, and that if you have to ask the code for a speedy determination of the criminal cases that uh, involved in the killing of the people, the government will always say that, uh, that they take appropriate and uh, necessary measures. My view is all the measures are not convincing because we know how to go in the way people are actually. Um, they can easily be shot, and I always give a, a small example that uh, you may find a person who sees a bicycle or something in the world is easily shot. Um, but how come we get out of this people without the meeting are not easily uh, caught? But we should look at you know, it's, it's a big issue because, well, the whole community of community in the rural areas. Uh, believe in witchcraft. So it's difficult really to, 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 to catch or to get hold of the, the perpetrators. It, it's a big situation. It's not just get, uh, taking someone or getting hold of, of, of the, the perpetrator. It's, it's a big situation because those people, police, police officers residing in those villages, they also believe in witchcraft. And they also believe maybe a person which I believe in is a cause to the community. So they, they feel that it's better that person is, is going to lead of the community. For example, last year, apart from Johanna, the child who was cut off his legs and his arm and later on, there was another child who got disappeared in a village. And then People in that community say that the mother of that child who is kidnapped should move away from that village because the members of that village they don't want to get problems. They didn't say what kind of problems, but impliedly you can say they were always thinking that mother is a problem. <laughs> is a problem in the first place. Why? Because she gets part of the person without the meeting, which is giving, according to the media class, in the village. Uh, thank you for joining us today. That is Ali Posse joining us uh, from the University of Zanzibar, giving us a little update on uh, the Albina killings that have been uh, quite prevalent in that country over the last uh, 15 years, really. More than 300 people have been killed since the year 2000. Let's just have a look at what you're saying. What are some of your views? Okay, well, we're going to speak to the president, I can't tell you. Our presidential correspondent, Zwandilias Beje. Beje is standing by with the president. Thanks, Why? Yes, Evan, thank you very much. Uh, as you have uh, indicated to the viewers, the president is here. He's just come out of the house of uh, the late Minister Shaban. Mr. President, uh, you've just uh, seen the family. Just tell us what, uh, how, how is the family coping with all of this? Well, it is a very difficult thing to cope with. Um, this is a, a very big loss, not just to the family, uh, I think to the community where Minister Collins come from, uh, a big loss to the African National Congress, his organization that he has grown <clears throat> within a big loss to the government and a big loss to the country. 
and I think it must be devastating to the family. I spoke to his wife uh, just before 5 a.m. on the day of the accident, as soon as I got the message from the Premier. And I, I made a mistake because I think I was really shaken because the wife had not received the message. And I also spoke to the son. And I only, only later I realized that they must have been saying, what is the president talking about? And of course, um, this is a big loss for the country. Uh, comrade, the minister, Collins Chabani, <clears throat> was an asset to the country. We deployed him in this particular department because it is a key department in the runnings of the government. And we knew that he will always deliver on what is given. And it's difficult to accept the, what has happened. In no way a driver would just decide to turn on the road with such a big truck without checking. It's difficult to explain what happened. Um, of course, I've seen the family. Uh, the daughter has just arrived this morning from London, where well, she's studying in London. And I've seen the brother and other members of the family. We have conveyed our condolences, our sympathies, and we have guaranteed that we are going to be with them throughout this period of mourning. And we'll continue to be with them, as we have been with them all the time, because Collins was more than just a minister, a colleague, a comrade. He was like a brother. Uh, to me, he was like a son. I had known him when he was 17 years old. I was part of those who made him to join the ANC and uh, prepared him politically, militarily, as an MK, and prepared him <clears throat> also for government. In um, 2009, when I had to take over as the president of this country, he led the subcommittee that discussed the restructuring of government, discussed with him the necessity of new departments. He led that. Uh, and, and really made a contribution. <clears throat> so we have lost. Uh, he leaves a gap that is going to be very difficult to close. However, we are part of the family. We have been here. We have been talking to his brother, <clears throat> who is very devastated as well. Uh, was grown up by Collins himself. And, and there are ministers who have been assigned to work here, Minister of uh, <coughs> Environment Affairs and Basic Education, Deputy Minister who deputized Collins, <coughs> Ayanda Lolvo, uh, Minister of Public Works uh, <coughs> on this side, uh, Nwesi. They are the ones who are permanently here to work with the family to arrange <coughs> everything that is going to be done. So we hope that uh, we will mourn with dignity as an organization, as government, as the country, and bid him farewell on the day that the family will decide jointly with the, with the government. Um, I'm sure the deputy president will be coming around as well. <clears throat> he is also be visiting the families of the two protectors who <clears throat> passed on together with uh, Collins. We are also going to be working with them uh, to ensure that uh, their own <clears throat> processes are supported uh, by also <clears throat> the government. So. We are sad, we are saddened, we are shocked, 
but we have to accept the reality and try to be strong, all of us. Uh, but we have lost a comrade, a man, a citizen, a minister uh, with great attributes and qualities who had a long, <coughs> a long time to contribute to the government. But he has contributed to a greater extent. <coughs> so we would like to say that uh, the country really must join the family in mourning with dignity the life and celebrate his life, which he spent very well in fighting for the liberation of this country and as well as the reconstruction of this country. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. There was President Jacob Zuma there, having visited the Chabane family to offer his condolences and to comfort the family. It's back to the studio. Thank you very much. A very somber occasion there, President Jacob Zuma, just visiting the Chabane family home in Vatikloof, Pretoria. He called him a comrade, a brother, and a son, a man that is known since he was 17 years old. That is the late Minister Collins Chabane, the Minister of Public Service and Administration, was killed tragically uh, early on Sunday morning in an accident on the N1 highway just outside of Polokwane. That's where we wrap the show. It's a rather sad, somber note. Of course, we broadcast live from our studios in Auckland Park, Johannesburg, every weekday morning between 9 and 10 a.m. We repeat the show at 2 in the afternoon and the total rebroadcast then the following morning at 5 a.m. We also live on YouTube during the whole time with the show available on demand on our YouTube channel all of the time. This is SABC News. You've been watching Newsroom. Good morning.